Hi, Mark. Next up really? is Mark Smalley. Yeah, we had a, a technical issue. Uh, yeah, yeah I, was just, I was just chatting to Jamie in the preparation room, and I, I said, have there been any, any issues so far? He said, yeah. no. <laughs> this was the first one but, I got. Like a good idea, you just close the browser, <laughs> start it again, yeah, and it's worked. Yeah, started up. I love, so, I love, uh, I love the panda, by the way, on the top of the stairs. Ah, you saw it. You are the first yeah, person yeah. who uh, who makes the remark on right? it. Yeah, and yeah. I've got something similar here on the top ah, of my cupboard here. I've got a purple cow. <laughs> and f and for anybody who's interested in marketing, that has that has significance. A purple cow. <laughs> but I'll, oh, I'll leave I'll leave that as something to think about. Uh, are we uh, at enough distance? Because I see you have the two meters T-shirt on. Yeah, that's right. It, I was, I was, I, I was agonising a bit about what what T-shirt to wear today. I thought um, I had a choice. I thought I could, I could wear the um, wear the DevOps days. Oh, look, look yeah, which one I'm wearing. Yeah, that, yeah that's right. But I, I thought that, I thought that might be a bit patronising because uh, because Patrick's organising it. Then I thought I could I could wear the T-shirt that I got made to uh, to promote my new book, but I thought that was, that's a bit too commercial. So let's do something topical. So if you just remember, keep a tapir's length from each other, you know, one and a half meters, two meters, just to play it safe. Then we should we should be good. So uh, your talk is going to be about high velocity virtue and values, and it's a pre-recorded talk, and you will be here for a, a live. Q and A. So, yeah, uh, and, and uh, yeah, and for, just just for the for the audience, the the talk is twenty minutes, so we've got uh, we've got plenty of time for questions yeah. and answers. So, shoot. I, shoot. Yeah, I'm going to uh, start the screen share, and hopefully, if there are no technical glitches, that will work. Last year, I wrote a book called High Velocity IT. This year, I wrote a book about that book called Reflections on High Velocity IT. This month, I wrote an article about the book about the book. And this is a presentation about, well, it's not that bad, but it is something that you would expect from the IT paradigmologist, wouldn't you? Now, I'm a writer, a speaker, a trainer. I do the uh, the Phoenix Project game, which you might be familiar with, which is great fun. And I'm a bit of a bridge builder because I um, I mingle with, with several communities and like to connect them together. Feel free to get in touch with me. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You'll find lots of my content there and fairly active on Twitter as well. Now, before I add to your cognitive load, I'd like to check in with you uh, on your emotions. So how are you feeling? And I have two questions for you. The first one being, what's your energy level? High energy, low energy? Where are you on this, uh, on this spectrum? And then second question is, is that positive energy or negative energy? Have I managed to annoy you, for instance, already? Because where you are on these axes, that will determine how you how you view things. And this is this is a nice little exercise. Uh, I borrowed it from Simone Joe Moore, and it's something you can take take back and do at work, either in physical meetings or virtual meetings. Just check in with people's uh, humanity, acknowledge that they're people, and um, it's a great little thing to do. I think people appreciate that. But just reflecting on uh, yeah, wh where am I today? How can I contribute? Now I've been to more conferences than I can remember. And there's always a, um, a, a pattern that I come across. You, you might recognize it as well. There's somebody droning on about something that they're passionate about, like I'll be in a minute. And you will be asking yourself three questions. The first button, one being, huh? what on earth are they talking about? Because I'm talking from my frame of reference and you're listening from your frame of reference. And it would be a miracle if we were on the same page. So that's the first hurdle to take. The second one is, uh, really? Is there any evidence for that? What's that based on? 
And then the, the final question that you'll find yourself asking, asking yourself is, um, uh, so what? When I get back to work, uh, what's the relevance of this? These questions hurt really so. I, th I think that's, um, that's something that you'll recognize through, um, throughout conferences. Um, now, in order to preempt that, uh, that last question, the so question, here are four statements that I think pretty much summarize the, um, the talk and which are also the structure of the talk. They're talking about value, particularly from a business perspective, how to sell the great stuff that we do to business executives, uh, values and their role for a meaningful and rewarding employee experience. And the talk to the concept of velocity, that it's not just about speed, but about trade-offs and doing the right things quickly. And finally, virtue or ethics, which is about um, deciding which is the least worse course of action. There's always a compromise with, with ethics. So starting with value, I'm sure many of you have seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, and may remember the scene at Sell Me This Pen, where the aspiring salespeople try to sell a pen to the presenter. And they struggle because they're, they're focusing more on the features of the pen than the benefits. And that's something that we often have in IT. Uh, so here's a case that you, you, you might recognize. There's a CIO uh, and there's on the left-hand side here and speaking with a CEO and he's trying to get funding for a DevOps improvement initiative. Because, you know, DevOps is, is serious shit. Uh, but before he can make his case, the CEO interjects and says, um, now, why should we be investing in this DevOps instead of in other things like, um, like acquisitions, for instance? And the only thing the poor, poor CIO can come up with is, is nonsense like continuous containers, immutable microservices, and culture as code, which of course is complete techno babble. So he gets sent away and he says, come back when you, when you learn to speak my language. Now to cut a long story short, because I could spend quite a while talking about this, this topic. And in fact, I wrote uh, that paper on the right-hand side, the business value of DevOps for DASA. I'm quite pleased with how that came out. But various sources on this topic um, it, it tend to say it's about faster delivery of more resilient and cheaper IT with a happier workforce. I don't think you'll have much argument about, uh, about those terms. But they're still IT terms. So how do you translate that into, into business terminology? Well, let's take a look at faster IT services. You don't say that. You say quicker time to market, quicker time to customer, which, of course, generates more sales because you get into the market earlier. Uh, or quicker business change if it's an internal initiative. You don't talk about more resilient IT services, but instead you talk about fewer costly disruptions to business operations. You talk about better customer experience, which leads, of course, to more satisfied customers that become more loyal customers. The loyal customers are prepared to pay a higher price for your products and services because they value you. So that so suddenly we've made the, made the switch from resilience to higher prices, which is quite uh, quite significant. Now, don't talk about cheaper IT services, but expressed in terms of capital expenditure and operational expenditure. Um, but ask yourself the question first whether you should be talking about IT costs, because sometimes IT costs are just a fraction of total business costs and aren't really high on the agenda of the CEO. So try and discover how, what proportion of your costs uh, are related to IT. That's quite an interesting exercise and not many people know it. And finally, whatever you do, don't talk about happier IT people. It's bad enough that you have them. Talk instead about high performance organizations because that's the kind of language that will appeal to the CEO will you get you the funding because you've ex you haven't you, you're not doing anything different you've just expressed it in a different way so think along those lines i find that very interesting uh, 
myself. Um, moving from the business perspective to the employee perspective, you can see in this diagram here, organizations co-create value with and for uh, many parties. We just explored the shareholder axis, the business value, and now looking at the employee axis, thinking about an employee experience, what's, um, uh, what's a, a meaningful and rewarding uh, in, employee experience. And what I've been thinking about recently is uh, when you aren't talking about money anymore, you move into the area of, um, of, of fulfillment of aspirations. It's a bit like the Maslow period of uh, pyramid in a sense. Uh, you can read them for yourself, but I'll, I'll just give a voice over to a couple of them. Uh, helping get customers jobs done, I think is the crucial on. Um, uh, it's really, when you think about it, we, we, many of us have the privilege of contributing to the well-being and prosperity of digital service consumers. And that is, you know, that's a great source of, uh, of satisfaction that you're doing something meaningful. I think that's a sense of purpose. Uh, you might recall Dan Pink's uh, autonomy, mastery and purpose, which I think makes good sense. That's really the key thing for me, but also being able to trust and be trusted in an organization. And the last one I'll, I'll highlight is uh, working in complex environments where things are ambiguous and uncertain, just recognizing that and dealing with it. I think they, they are, they are you know, if you can fulfill these kind of aspirations, you, you, you've got a pretty decent employee experience. Now, it was interesting, a while ago, I was asked to review Gene Kim's new book, The Unicorn Project. I, in fact, I wrote a little uh, article on LinkedIn called The Phoenicorn Project, because The Unicorn Project is a, is a sequel to The Phoenix Project. And he, he talks about the five ideals in The Unicorn Project, and I've depicted them here in orange. And I saw pretty quickly that there was a, there was a great similarity with the five aspirations that I was developing in a parallel universe when I was writing my book. So it was somewhat reassuring that, uh, that these are the kind of things that people like us seem to value. I thought that was quite neat. And at this conference, Gene is doing his own talk on the, um, on the five values. So I'd certainly encourage you to... Uh, to um, attend that as well. Thanks for attending this one, by the way. Final comments on values. Some organizations tend to impose their corporate values on their employees. Um, when you think about it, it might even be morally dubious whether you should do that, impose values on individuals. And I think it's not very effective either, because if everybody thinks the same way, you're gonna get groupthink which is notoriously ineffective. Um, so you need diversity, but you don't, you, you don't want too much diversity because on the other end of the spectrum, if people are constantly arguing with each other, negotiating the, the differences in, uh, in values, in beliefs, in opinions, then that's not very productive either. So you want something in the middle, and I, I like to call it coherent diversity, enough diversity to... Um, uh, generate new ideas, but not enough to, uh, to, to make it unproductive because you're having too many arguments, coherent diversity. And a bit on the theme of evolution and them and us, um, we like to stick to our kind of people, but if we do that too much, apart from that group thing, you, you, know, you, you, you inbreed and you go extinct on an evolutionary axis. So, you need those strangers, them and us, you need the strangers, we need a bit of them for us to become a better us, uh, which I thought was a quite, quite a nice way of putting it. So if you like to tweet that, feel free. Final comments here, it's delightful to see that organizations are being more mindful of the need for psychological safety in the workplace and being attentive to stress levels. Psychological safety is when you feel able to express yourself without fear for your reputation or your position. 
And as far as stress is concerned, again, it's a balance like with, with diversity. Um, you need enough resilience to deal with the, the functional tension that you always have in organizations. And, you know, things happen. Sometimes you have to, uh, things escalate a bit, have to be able to deal with that. But if the stress is constantly at an unhealthy level, that is not acceptable. As Dr. Christina Maslach, who's uh, specialized in burnout, says, we need less toxic workplaces, not more resilient canaries, which is a great, another thing you can quote, not from me, but from her. Third topic, velocity. If you have a bit of a scientific background, you might recall that velocity is not only about speed, but also about direction. If you translate that into the organizational context that we're speaking about now, that's about doing the right thing quickly. And it's, it's a balancing act. It's the, you might, might have seen this sign, um, we offer three kinds of service, good, cheap, and fast. You can pick any two. It's a bit like the, uh, the iron triangle uh, that, uh, that you come across quite often. It's balancing between these, these aspects. And crucially, it's a dynamic balancing act because things changed often on a, on a daily basis. You know, things happen, you have to react quickly, either to um, deal with an incident or grasp a market opportunity, which means you have to act quickly, which means that you might take shortcuts resulting in technical debt. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, as long as you're willing and able to pay the interest on the debt which manifests itself in the form of incidents that occur, you get collateral damage and have to deal with that, repair the, repair the damage. Um, but also it manifests itself as in inefficiencies because the next time you want to change the software that's been badly coded, it's gonna take you more time. Now, if you're happy to pay that interest, there's nothing bad with having, having debt. Um, but you probably need to repay it from time to time to get it down to an acceptable level, which means refactoring software and stuff like that. So pay attention to technical debt, get it to an acceptable level. Uh, final point here, doing the right thing often implies that the organization uh, acts beyond its direct economic interests, which is a nice segue into the final topic about virtue or ethics. Uh, you might recognize this uh, gentleman here, Dave Snowden, the guy who's strongly associated with the Kneffin sense-making framework that I've depicted here. I'm not going to talk about the framework. It is in the in both of the books. Um, if you haven't heard of the Kneffin framework, please look it up. It'll give you a headache, but it's worth it. Now, for the first book I wrote, I asked Dave to write a piece about ethics, and it's an absolutely delightful piece. One of the best pieces in the um, in the book, in fact, it's um, and, and the, I'm summarizing his his piece in in some simple statements. Technology has an unprecedented impact on society and the economy, and even to the to the degree that lives depend on it. If you think about the the Boeing seven three seven Max tragedy, for instance, where software and software engineering seem to play a crucial role. You know, lives depend on this kind of stuff. Um, second statement is that our actions have unintended consequences, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And that painfully, we are morally responsible for our actions, including the, including the consequences. And that means that organizations have to monitor uh, ethical behavior. That really means that uh, that ethics draws drawing to the conclusion that ethics belongs in the core of education, which I don't think is 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 done to the strongest degree at the moment. So that's something to pay attention to. But it's, of course, it's not only about education; it's also about the the values that people have, the character they have, which is partially genetically determined, but also by by their upbringing. Um, but whatever, it's um, it's a difficult topic. This it's uh, ethical decisions are 
aren't black or white there's there's all you're always discussing the least worst course of action you have to talk about this stuff that's the that's the main message here uh, this picture by the way was taken at the 10th devops days in ghent in belgium uh, last year where i organized an open space for everybody to look miserable talking about ethics i did a little write-up uh, on the on the talk, uh, DevOps days and Obama agree that it's messy out there. I think that's word messy characterizes ethical decisions. I didn't did another article as well. The only way is ethics. Uh, you find those easily enough, I think. So that's um, that gives you something to think about. So these these were the topics I uh, run through pr pretty quickly. Uh, all covered in the in the two books to uh, to a great degree along with other topics as well now when i mentioned that this book the first book is an idle book you might uh, have the um, have the idea of throwing rotten tomatoes at me but i've been reassured in the code of conduct of this conference that there's no discrimination against people of service like me so I now feel the love flowing out to me, which is uh, very generous of you. But I must say it's a, it's a weird book. It's uh, certainly the weirdest uh, idle book that's ever been published, um, which is why I let Spock say it's idle Jim, but not as we know it. And it's getting a nice reception in, um, in the recent DevOps uh, meetup in, in Amsterdam. People saying nice things about it. Not, you know, we never thought this was about ITIL. Cool, universal touches the subjects I'm passionate about. So it's very, uh, very gratifying. Uh, so, finally, now pointing you in the direction of the book with a discount, uh, the book about the book that I self-published on Amazon, which was great fun. Can recommend that, and some free content in the weekly excerpts. That I've just started putting on a LinkedIn article. Here I wrote this. That's the name of the article. I think you'll find that easily enough. So I'm leaving you with the um, with my belief that this is guidance that matters for people like us who care. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark, for that presentation. It was. Uh... Really nice. Uh, I see we have a, also a question on Slack, but if you do, if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I'll start with a question of my own. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we as ITers, we talk too much in a, we talk too much techno babble when we want to sell our ideas. Do you think it's uh, getting better over the years? Because I've seen this shift uh, during the last 10 years of, of DevOps. Uh, it seems to me it, it's getting better. Otherwise, the DevOps ID wouldn't be held uh, accountable around the table. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah. Or you are is, still uh, dark? No, no. Well, there's, there's always room for improvement, but I, I, I agree. We're moving in the right direction. It's interesting, by the way, it, slight slide. Let's have a look at the time. We've got plenty of time. Um, Out of five minutes, so no nice, problem. nice little little detour. Thinking about the how DevOps came about ten years ago now, and the the fact that the name was uh, was coined, I believe, more or less by accident to give a conference a name. We had to Patrick had to give give the conference a name, so it was called DevOps. But I be, believe he played around with the with the term Agile System Administration. Yep. True. Around that. Uh, now, if you go back to Agile, when they were for writing the Agile Manifesto back around the turn of the century, uh, somebody suggested instead of the name Agile, conversational uh, software development. So we could have been talking about the conversational software development manifesto, and Patrick could have been talking about the conversational system administration. But the point, the point I wanted to make was that 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 thing about conversation, that is one of I think one of the key um, key things that people are working on, getting people closer together, where we often talk in some circles about business and IT alignment, 
which implies that there are two entities that have to be aligned. Uh, I think now people are talking more about convergence of the two entities. So we don't no longer talk about business and IT as separate organizational entities, but they're part of the same often product-based team. So I, I think it's... Um, I think we're moving in the right direction, yep. but it's like it's like somebody said uh, that the future is already here. It's not just evenly distributed. Yeah. Hmm. So maybe we'll need to add another ten years to the DevOps days movement. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing is, it, it, I, I've real, only recently I realised that I'm I'm now experiencing my sixth decade in professional IT because I started off at the end of the seventies. I'd have seventies, eighties, nineties, now we're in the twenties, and I've I've seen various movements happen, like the first the project project management movement in the seventies, eighties when we were building systems, now that ended up in dictatorship. Then you had the IT service management. Um, movement which ended up in bureaucracy in some circles then you had the agile movement which ended up in in people arguing about how to stick po post-it notes on a board and so it'll be interesting to look in in look back in 10 years time and see see how DevOps yeah. ended up. <laughs> these things all, always go wrong in the end it, all, they, they always end up end up in tears there's always a new idea uh we have yeah. a, a question uh, on uh, on slack from uh, chris Hunt. Uh, he quotes you, uh, immoral to impose corporate values on people. Uh, so, and he says, he asks, what if company values were defined by a committee of peers? Does that support coherent diversity or still promote groupthink? Actually, I also uh, wrote this down as, a, as like a, a possible question. Uh, like you see all these startups also like defining their, 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 their values. It's like uh, you can't find a startup without any any values. But then, what does it really mean? So, but maybe first comment on a uh, Gris is a question. So, what well, the, the the committee of peers? Yeah, well, I think if if the if the committee of peers is has a good distribution across the company that you don't have group, you know, so it represents various uh, opinions. I think that's pretty good. Uh, the thing you've got to watch out for, and we, could, you know, if we if we had a startup, just the two of us, we could agree on stuff. But if we just keep to our own little circle, um, we'll we'll start inbreeding cognitively. I hope just cognitively inbreeding, and go extinct. Uh, so we need diversity. We need the, it's the paradoxical paradoxical thing about life. We need to mingle with strangers who we don't like by definition in order to survive on the longer term. So we need to strengthen the gene pool. And I think that just playing around with that topic of values, being aware of the values that you have and um, having strong opinions, but holding them weakly. So being prepared to revise the opinions that you have, I think, and I think that's, that's the basis of the scientific method anyway, uh, believing in something in a hypothesis until you discover there's a better, a better hypothesis. Okay, thank you. And uh, that uh, unfortunately wraps up uh, our time. It's uh, time for a break now. Thank you for your uh, time, Mark. Maybe onward question, where are you located? Because I'm located, at, yeah, just outside Amsterdam. Where ah, okay, I've, li you're, I've you're lived in the Netherlands, Netherlands. Lived in yeah. the Netherlands now for, for 45 years. Uh, that explains why you are at uh, also yeah. at uh, a meetup. Final, you know? final, yeah. final message, guys. Keep your distance. Yeah. Okay. Great Thank stuff. you, Mark, for your time. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you.